and uh, you know change your name <laughs> if you want <laughs> but you probably won't need to <laughs> all right lovely all right well let's just get settled a little bit maybe just for the benefit of the people who've arrived late if you could maybe just put in the chat line um, just where you're from and how you're coming to the meeting you know what's what's up for you right now um, if you could just pop that into the chat line uh, so we can just hear from everyone make sure everyone's able to hear me might be just a, a one emotion word or a short phrase or something like that Curiosity, Northern California. Sweet. Thanks, Alan. Stay from Brazil. A bit tired and a bit excited. Yep, lovely, thank you. Southern California, conflict happening around me. Oh gosh, yes. Oh, heart goes out to you. It's interesting, in Australia, we're having a sort of second wave um, and of COVID and uh, it's really interesting how less, um, what's the word, communitarian everybody seems to be this time around. <clears throat> First time around, there was a, sense of shared experience and now there's a sense of exasperation and anger and disconnection and it's quite interesting to see how that's playing out in terms of lack of cooperation but um, as I'm saying this I'm noticing in myself that in Australia the situation is much less serious than it is in America for instance. Um, oh thank you all. Um, Yes, okay, well look, let me get into it and I'm knowing that some people need to go. Um, the thing I want to share with you first of all is um, just a menti link there in the chat line. I thought it'd be uh, just a couple of things I'd love to get to know you a bit better. Um, this is meant to be, you know, experiential workshop. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I will um, give you a bit of a feel for uh, the broader context that I'm using this tool in uh, and then most of the session will be engaging with the tool itself uh, and uh, so but if you could go to that mentee link just clicking on that link there um, the first well actually I did want to just do a quick exercise with you um, so um, First of all, just I'd invite you all just to either close your eyes if you like, or if you could just come into a relaxed, attentive posture that conveys to yourself your intention to just become aware for a moment. And just letting yourself settle into your body. Feel into your breath, the feel of being here in the body in this moment. Letting your awareness Settle for a moment on a contemplation of what brings you to working in the field of conflict. Just holding that question lightly for a moment. What matters to you about this work that you presumably do?
What interests you about conflict? What draws you to it? Working with conflict. Might be needs within you. It might be values that you hold. It might be goals that you have in your life. Any of these expressions of what matters to me. And you might imagine yourself engaging in conflict resolution in some way in whatever form makes sense for you in your context. Perhaps it's a mediation session or it's training or perhaps it's just one-on-one -on -one work with people or maybe it's just your own conflicts. See if you can bring to mind a context where you're anticipating doing that work. For me, I imagine walking into a room where I'm about to do dialogue training in a highly charged team that's had lots of conflict. And as you notice yourself getting ready to enter the situation, perhaps noticing what shows up for you in the body and in the heart. And letting that go, just coming back to the body, coming back to this moment and a sense of what matters to me here and now, what matters to me in this session, what qualities do I want to bring to this session. Not just what do I want to get out of it, but how do I want to be? in this moment? What do I want to bring to this session of myself? Thank you. So, I'll just put the Menti link in the chat line again in case anyone's joined since we put it in last time. Um, there's some options here um, and I'd love to get a bit of a feel for who's in the room and what brings you to, what most attracts you to working with conflict. Uh, I just made this stuff up before the session. Um, you, you, the way it works is you, um, hopefully you'll be able to see something like this and you just choose an option that you want to put in as number one and then you choose another option um, and so forth uh, and fill it in like that if you can. Um, and I'll go back here and present. When you get to the end, I think there's an option to submit.
if you've got another uh, response that isn't on the list, then put it in the chat line, please, because uh, who knows, I might have might have missed out on some really big categories. Um, it's just this is not a scientific experiment. <laughs> So we've got uh, so far six responses, 13 participants. So I'll just wait for a moment. It feels like a calling. Wow. Creating a more harmonious society. I um, actually, if I'd, I'd let you in on a on a truth here. Um, I feel that all of those are true for me at some time or other, and I've been struck in listening to um, some of the other talks and so forth. How many people say that they feel as though they're conflict avoidant and yet they work in in conflict? It's quite fascinating how um, it, you know maybe that's us working our stuff out a little bit. <laughs> I certainly feel as though that's probably true for me. <laughs> uh, being able to help better those who are at the end of their lives, oh, gorgeous. A beautiful motivation. Thank you. Lovely. Okay. Well, let's move on then. Um, the, the next question, I'd love to get a bit of a feel. Yeah, I don't know if any of these resonate with you, but um, I, I invited you to think about moving into a situation where you'd be mediating a conflict or in some way influencing. I just, I guess I should, shouldn't have said mediation because maybe some of you don't do that. But um, you in some way wanting to help, and I wonder, and and there's a sense of a lot of tension in the room, either with the person you're talking with, or maybe there's a personal involvement. Um, thank you, Tanya. I appreciate that. Um, is there any of these that resonate for you? If not, leave that and just put something in the chat line. What shows up for you emotionally when you are involved in this work? Wondering if I have the skills, anticipating who, yeah, gosh, that's a biggie for me. A little frightened, yep. Thinking of how I can be of service, anticipate, yep. Lovely. I find this profoundly moving. I'm just unexpectedly moved to, to to see the two most frequent responses at this point are both doubt and wanting to be of service and a little frightened <laughs> and imagining all that could go wrong. I misspelled that, but in a minute. Um, calm, excited. I, I wish I was one of you calm people. <laughs> Actually, sometimes there's a sort of calm that comes after the, the fear, isn't there? That uh, where you just connect with yourself and mm, beautiful. Okay, lovely. Thank you. I think I've got a a feel, and I think maybe you've got a feel for our shared humanity in this group. Here we are from all over the world, coming together and and bringing both our our needs and our values, but also our fears and our concerns. Um, I just one last question. What are the personal qualities you most wish to bring to your work with conflict? So I'm thinking here of, um, you know, what I might call values. Um, openness, respect, um, calm, perhaps. Although to some extent that's an emotion, but it's sort of what I'm reaching for here are the the things, the the qualities of your behaviour, the qualities of how you want to be in, um, yeah, love, sweet, how you want to be in your work, connectedness, wisdom, presence. Courage.
Thank you, Laura. Oh, gosh. Really appreciating that contribution. Um, thank you, Maureen. So presence is very big, just as well, really. <laughs> really key. Generous listening, well resourced, love, courage, compassion, patience, spaciousness, centeredness, safety, tolerance. Beautiful. Thank you. Professional and prepared, non biased. Lovely. Thank you. Wonderful. So, I'm going to move on. And, oh, sorry, I have one last question. I promise this is the last one. Uh, this is just relevant to what I'm going to be doing in this session. I'm interested to know if you've had experience with either of these things. It's absolutely fine if you put none at all. That's like, um, don't worry, you're not in the wrong space, but uh, I just want to get a sense of the background of some of you in the room. Uh, Nonviolent communication is Marshall Rosenberg's work, um, now popularised around the world. Um, a language of compassion, if you like. Acceptance and commitment therapy is a behavioural uh, approach to therapy. It's a mindfulness-based approach. Um, <clears throat> And excuse me, again, uh, not something you need to know in order to be here, but it is part of what I do. Okay, great. Most people have had a little contact with nonviolent communication. Um, one of the things you might know about it is it's very much focused on needs, people's needs in the moment, and through needs, finding shared ground for us to. Um, to make life more wonderful, in the words of Marshall Rosenberg, to um, to connect and create, uh, move through conflict. I didn't mention this in the in the outline, and I wish I had it, but I am seeking, as part of my aims, to um, to uh, well, first of all, I want to introduce an approach called pro-social, which is our container for this matrix work, um, and show you a little bit about that. Uh, so I'm just going to go back here for a moment. Okay, so we've got a few people who know about nonviolent communication and practically nobody who knows about it act. So that's really helpful to me. <clears throat> um, I'd like to, the main thing we're going to be doing is exploring one tool and its application, the ACT matrix. And if we have time, I'd really love it if we can explore the integration of this approach with nonviolent communication. This is probably the thing that I'm most excited about right at the moment, having just um, uh, finished a couple of books by uh, Mickey Cashton, who some of you may know from Bay Area and NBC, uh, just wonderful books. One of them called Reweaving the Human Fabric, just superb. And it, it uh, excited me because of the connections, I think, to this pro-social thing. Now, most of you will have not, never heard of pro-social. Um, pro-social is what I do. I'm, I'm part of a, uh, a group of us, a large group of us now, uh, over 350 facilitators around the world um, using this approach, which is basic, based in, um, yes, I can, sure, Mickey Kirsten. Um There you go. And it's called Reweaving the Human Fabric. I think, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that's that's her most more socially oriented book. There's a there's another one called Spinning. Someone will have to help me out with that, it, which is more sort of personally oriented. But I found them both fantastic. But the Reweaving the Human Fabric is really close to our aim of um, creating a more pro-social world, basically a more cooperative world. 
So um, I'm going to just very briefly tell you about ProSocial um, and it is four things. It's a perspective, a research effort, a practical process and a community of practice. Um, so as a perspective, uh, some of the key elements are, it's um, one of the things that it draws upon is uh, Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize winning work on the commons. If you don't know Eleanor Ostrom, uh, she won the 2009 Nobel Prize for Economics for her work exploring how groups all around the world uh, have managed to successfully manage the commons over tens, hundreds, even thousands of years. Uh, it, contrary to the sort of economic mythology that we're all selfish and self-interested and if you leave us alone we'll just exploit the commons and and destroy it. Uh, so she basically won the Nobel for showing that this from an even in economic language this idea of homo economicus the sort of selfish man is um, is is not correct if you provided you have the right conditions in place. And she articulated eight core design principles that um, we have developed a little in our work because she was talking specifically about resource management. We've slightly broadened the context to talk about groups of all sorts. And we didn't do that absent theory or evidence. We um, made use of evolutionary theory and some of the ideas of cultural evolution and cultural selection that uh, basically also uh, converge with her design principles and um, what we what we David Sloan Wilson my primary collaborator on this work um, is an evolutionary biologist and uh, famous in particular for the idea of that it's not individuals that are necessarily selected all the time, but groups. So it might be survival of the fittest group as opposed to survival of the fittest individual, which is a selection pressure for cooperation rather than competition. Um, so he saw how these core design principles were expressions of evolutionary principles that are true in all sorts of groups. I joined after his collaboration with Ostrom um, and myself and a number of other behavioural scientists uh, brought the piece around it's the quality of awareness. You know, you can have principles like equity. The principles are things like equity, fast and fair conflict resolution, transparency, um, appropriate feedback and so forth. You can have all of those as principles and rules, but if you bring to it a quality of awareness that's rigid and controlling and and fearful, then uh, you're going to have, the relationships are still going to be coercive. So some of the work that we do is more from the inside out and some of it is more from the outside in on the quality of the agreements and systems that we create. Throughout our work, um, we, we are basically trying to work at multiple levels, the interior of the person, the whole person, one-to-one -one relationships, the group, the small group, and groups of groups and whole systems. And so we're really conscious in choosing tools that will work at multiple levels. And um, the one I'm showing you today uh, works in that way. Uh, and basically the one I'm showing you today, the ACT matrix, gives space for conversations about individual interests and collective interests. If you come from an NVC background, you could say needs. But from my point of view, interests include needs, values, goals. It's just a very loose umbrella term for what matters to us in broad ways. As a research agenda, we're interested in questions like these. And uh, there's abundant research for our um, backing for our work. Uh, ProSocial as a community of practice, I mentioned we have at this point 350 facilitators. We have a uh, growing um, regions of communities of practice in the Americas, Europe, Africa, and in the Asia Pacific. We're working in um, with uh, healthcare companies, regeneration, uh, regenerate, regenerative agriculture initiatives, uh, donut economics as a um, Kate Rayworth's group uh, looking at um, planetary boundaries. 
Cities uh, is a, an initiative to help uh, cities become more cooperative and more environmentally sustainable and so on. Um, private enterprise, government departments and uh, charities and, and community groups around the world. But what's probably most concrete about it is what's the process and I, I did just want to say all this to give you a bit of a sense of um, the broader context into which this tool that we're going to explore, which is the matrix, fits. And basically we have a, a five-step process or a five-module um, process. The modules can be mixed and matched and put in different orders. If you've got a group that's not very psychologically minded, you could maybe start with the core design principles first. Um, if you want to start with the matrix, you can. Um, but broadly speaking, what we're trying to do is first of all map individual interests and build psychological flexibility and I'll explain all of these terms in a moment. Um, and then we're trying to find, to bring together those individual interests into a sense of shared identity and purpose. That's absolutely key for any cooperative initiative is a sense of belonging and a sense of um, identification with the purpose. Uh, then what we're trying to do then is explore these other core design principles and as I'll show you those in just a moment and set goals and do action learning to change the group to become more cooperative from the inside out. And of course we're researching all of this as we go um, to explore those questions from earlier. So I mentioned this idea of psychological flexibility. Um, sometimes I think maybe I should use some other term because uh, there's a lot of words floating around for the same idea. But um, this is what it's called in acceptance and commitment therapy or acceptance and commitment training if you prefer. Um, and it's called psychological flexibility and basically the way I just define it, talk about it, is the capacity to move in the direction of what really matters to us, our values and needs even in the presence of difficult emotion and experience, <clears throat> difficult thoughts, difficult feelings, difficult sensations, difficult images and memories um, that show up and often interfere with our capacity to really be the person that we want to be. I, another word could be mindful action. Um, it's got similarities to resilience, self-control, self-discipline, but all of those things have come in our society to mean buckling down and pushing through and, and you know, forcing ourselves and kind of essentially being coercive with ourselves. And psychological flexibility has this quality of, of being present to ourselves and noticing. It, in fact, it has six uh, interrelated and um, interwoven but, but discreet elements. Um, so if you think of the mindfulness component, you can think of you know contacting the present moment, being willing to be with whatever's present, accepting of whatever's present, not resignation, but being willing to be present to this is what's here right now. Instead of tightening up, you know, it's that orientation of ah, I can hold this rather than ah. Diffusion is I'm not my thoughts. My thoughts don't define me. They are an experience I'm having. And self as context is, if I'm not my thoughts, what am I? I'm, I'm the observer, I'm the container, I'm present. So you can see all of that resonates probably with what you know of mindfulness. From my point of view, it's a uh, beautiful, scientifically grounded um, explanation of mindfulness, the pieces of mindfulness. But then we also, we don't, we're focused in act not on just um, being mindful, but also m mindful change, uh, individual and social action, uh, behaviour change. And so a key part of our work is also helping people connect with values or needs, I want to say, for those of you that are familiar with NBC, I, I really do want to start to connect those things. By the way, I, at least I see values as kind of aspirational, they're almost reaching for the future, but they're qualities of behavior. You know, I want to be this way in my interactions with you. Whereas I feel needs have more the quality of this is what I need to thrive. This is the nutrients that I have to have. 
And goals, of course, are something different. Again, they're things you tick off and very much in the future. So I'm really enjoying experimenting with these different flavors of what matters to us because um, in a sense, in, in Western societies at least, there's always this sort of drive for progress. And you know, this is an American therapy um, and in a sense, values pull for the future a little bit. Uh, if you look at indigenous societies, there's more of a tendency for what are our needs and, and, and how can I cater for those? So this is something that I'm experimenting with and maybe we can get to talk about it later in the workshop. So last thing about pro-social is um, strong group identity and, uh, sorry, is the uh, eight core design principles. Here they are. I hope you can see them on your screen. I'll read them out. Um, strong group identity and understanding of purpose is the kind of thing that you, without that you don't have a cooperative group basically, or you don't have a highly cooperative group. Uh, so that's all as a sine qua non for, um, let me see if I can. Does that help at all, Laura, or does that not make any difference? Um, maybe someone could help me by typing in to the chat line the um, the things as I'm saying them. Um, equitable distribution of costs and benefits. Um, Fair and inclusive decision making, which is consent based. Um, uh, the how do you measure impact one is kind of a bigger question. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, peer based monitoring agreed upon behaviours. I don't really like that term anymore. I tend to use the word transparency. Uh, sorry, let me back up a bit. Without equity, so, so all of these principles are designed to help a group move from basically self focus, self-centeredness to group focus. So to some extent they're designed to suppress selfishness but mostly they're about encouraging and um, uh, let's see if I can zoom in, I can't zoom in. Um, mostly they're about encouraging um, cooperation. So we can't have um, People are extraordinarily sensitive to fairness in groups. We will not have cooperation unless everybody's needs are taken care of. But if you have a conversation about fairness, that generally goes pear-shaped and doesn't work very well. So this is where the language of win-win, as everybody's needs being taken care of, is how I tend to talk about uh, equity in a group, rather than, you know, am I getting a fair amount because, um, uh, it's um, it's fairness invokes social comparison is one thing that we've discovered in our work, but it's key to have there. The word fairness invokes social comparison is what I'm getting at. Okay, um, fair and inclusive decision making. Generally speaking, what we're trying to do is um, uh, bring about. Um, situations where everyone's needs can be satisfied. And if you're in an autocratic environment or a top-down leadership environment, the recipe for needs to be uh, not met in a group. So we tend to draw on consent-based decision-making processes. Thank you so much, Tanya, I appreciate that. Um, Peer-based monitoring of agreed on behaviours. What we mean by that, I mean, some of these terms are terms that Ostrom used in her, um, like monitoring. Um, and she used that in her work in economics, you know, but you can think of that as transparency. Uh, we need to be able to see what other people are doing in the group. Otherwise, in darkness, self-interest can thrive. Uh, this next one, graduated responding to increase helpful and decrease unhelpful behaviours. Um, sorry, transgression shouldn't be there. That is, um, uh, are really about feedback. You know, we need to start small. Hey, what was going on for you just then? I noticed you did this. And then, but what's really clear, and this was a bit of a surprise for me coming from the, uh, being a psychologist where we basically assume everybody, uh, well, I do assume everybody, you know, ultimately is operating out of their own needs and sense making of the world. 
Um, and we try to basically be nice to everybody <laughs> as a psychologist. But what I discovered in the literature was people don't trust groups where everybody tries to be nice. They just don't, as you, as you know well, probably from your own experience. Uh, there needs to be actually quite strong sanctions, including expulsion from the group. If, um, if the transgressions are serious enough in order for people to actually trust that they can be themselves, that they can be honest and authentic in a group. So sanctions are important as are reinforcers um, for responding to behavior. Here's where our home base is. Fast and fair conflict resolution is absolutely key to this process, resolving differences. Um, the, the authority to self-govern, the last two are about you think of the first one defines the purpose of the group. Um, two and three are about making sure everyone's needs are taken care of. Four, five and six are about responding appropriately to others in the group in a way that's helpful and constructive. And seven and eight are really about how the group relates to other groups. And what we found is that um, when you try to scale this up, um, how is this group going to relate to other groups? Basically, the group itself needs to have the authority to self-govern, not entirely. It might exist within an organisational context where it needs to inherit organisational values and goals, but they need to at least be able to enact um, elements one through six or they're not a coherent group. So in contexts like government departments, for instance, where uh, managers are not allowed to manage their own conflicts or they're not allowed to involve people in decision making or whatever. Um, it's very, very hard for them to actually form a high performing group. Um, and then the last one is basically what we mean by collaborative relations with other groups is that principles one through seven apply at the intergroup level as well. So. Um, so that, you know, there's shared identity and purpose between groups equity between groups, fair and inclusive decision making between groups. And can you see how that allows you to scale all the way up to um, large systems? Um, of, so I, I'm not going to spend too much more time talking about um, whoop, talking about uh, Uh, pro-social, but I did just want to flag. Here's a little, um, little, little question for you. See, there should be a multi-choice question there on your screen that looks a bit like, uh, not like that. Like, you might have to click on go to slide. Um, oh, you need to enter your name. Apparently, you can put whatever name you like. I don't mind. Let's see, and then, then what happens? Get ready to play. How do I enter to start quiz? Sorry. <laughs> Wait, what? I've uh, never done this before. There we go. Choose an answer. You're under pressure. Gosh. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was just trying something there. And uh, there we go. We do have a few people. Yeah. Brilliant. So if you answered balance and integrate self-interest and collective interest, that's what we're trying to do with the principle. So that, that is the first time I've ever tried that. It's a, uh, um, Maureen, thanks. Bye. Um, uh, but, um, there you go. Well done. I'm not going to compare you with one another. It's complete opposite of what I was trying to achieve in talking about pro-social. So what I'd like to do is, um, it, so that's our pro-social. That, um, that's the broader framework, if you like. Um, yeah, it was a bit fun. <laughs> um, so uh, there you go. Well, that's nice work. <laughs> All right. Um, 
Now I'm going to spend the rest of this workshop talking about this particular tool that's useful, I think very useful in the context of conflict resolution. Before we transition, does anyone have any questions or comments you want to raise? Um, if you'd like to, you can unmute yourself or um, you could uh, put something in the chat line. Um, somebody asked earlier about how do you measure impact. Um, Tanya, thank you. Yes, we have a range of measures that we make use of that um, uh, m some are mostly self-report, but we're also doing um, tracking of goals and goal performance over time. Um, website is prosocial.world. There we go. Thank you, Diana. Gosh, thank you. I'm appreciating the feedback. Um, appreciate negative feedback too, but uh, it's certainly energising for me to get some lovely engagement with the process. Too. Uh, thank you. All right. Um, so here we go. We're going into our specific tool. And I wanted to just um, take a moment just to connect with where you're at now and in particular to invite you maybe just pause for a moment come back into your body certainly I'm noticing tingling feeling of connection Just seeing what's present for you in this moment. And for this next part of the workshop, we're going to need a conflict situation that matters to you. It's up to you what you choose. Um, There'll be opportunities to share, um, although anonymously, primarily. We're going to use a tool to be able to share anonymously. So you can choose something that's pretty meaningful for you. You can choose whatever you like, but, but please choose a situation that you can manage to reflect upon in this session. You can hold calmly enough that you can bring some perspective to it, a little perspective. So real, current, if possible. It might be an unexplored conflict. It might be something that's just being tucked away, sort of niggling thing that you've come to accept and haven't wanted to bring out into the light for some time. Just seeing if you can bring that situation to life and seeing if there's something there about your longings. What matters to you about this? What needs are present for you? What hopes, expectations? Thank you. Coming back to the group. So 
So we're going to move into making use of a particular tool and it would I am very happy to share PowerPoint templates with you uh, with this tool um, if you'd like to email me. Um, I'll give you my email here which is also at the end of the talk but um, that's my email. Uh, but if we could all follow along on the screen for now, that would be most helpful. But and one thing you can do is grab yourself a piece of paper and a pen and just draw a cross on it. Um, and if you want, you could put a little circle in the middle with noticing because this tool, sometimes we call it the noticing tool. It's a lens on experience. It's a perspective. Okay, and you and I think it's important when you're working with clients individually. Many of you are working individually, or with groups. When you introduce this, that you just introduce it as a perspective. It's a way of dividing up human experience. And um, there are there are a couple of key distinctions, and these aren't just arbitrary. These are fundamental to human experience, which is why I think this tool is so powerful. The first is approach or avoid, what we might call toward or away. Basically all animals, all organisms have these two motivations. They approach that which they care for and love and that is important to them, that satisfies their needs. Um, and they move away from that which is scary. You know, my dog moves towards her food bowl and a walk and away from the dog next door. But what distinguishes humans from animals is this other key dimension of experience, that we have language. And from language, we have an inner world. We essentially construct an inner world of thoughts, feelings, imagery, stories, memories, expectations, judgments, <laughs> both the, the jackal and the giraffe, if you're familiar with those terms in NBC language, you know. Um, and, and that's distinct from the world of outer actions, the world of behavior, what people can actually see us doing. And making this distinction is really, really key, when, especially when you're working with conflict, because um, as you know, sometimes people see the truth is m my construction of it. And unless you can get them to step out of that and see what are you actually observing? What are, what's the person actually doing as opposed to what your interpretation is? You know, are they really trying to make you feel bad or are they actually just speaking? <laughs> over the top of you or something like that, you know. So this kind of distinction between the inner world and developing fluency and contact with our capacity to notice, huh, what's what's my construction and what's actually going on is a really key part of using this tool. And one of the reasons why I think it's so useful in the context of, of conflict. Um, and we have it up this way. I mean, there, if you look in the literature, you'll see the ACT matrix up the other way a lot of the time with the inner thoughts and feelings down the bottoms and, and uh, outer up the top. The reason we've kind of flipped it is because we like this metaphor of basically the head and the heart up the top and the hands and the feet down the bottom, what we actually do. Um, and so that's, feel free to put questions in the chat line as we go. Now, I'm going to introduce, um, for the purpose of this um, exercise, for this workshop, I'm going to introduce to you um, some, a version of this or some examples that I used when I was working with a school recently. Uh, we work with a school, 140 teachers, and their particular interest was in managing conflicts with, um, with parents, basically which is an increasing problem for the school. And so that's the way I introduced this tool for them as a tool to help them prepare for and facilitate uh, conversations with parents about their children. <coughs> so that's what the examples are all oriented towards that, but obviously your examples will be different. So I'm gonna invite you to just take a moment to write down 
um, you might want to write down somewhere what the situation is, just broadly speaking. Um, but if you've got it clearly in your head, you don't need to do that. Um, I'd like to invite you in, first of all, into this question of what matters most to me in this situation? And I'm talking here about your particular situation, your unique situation. Uh, so you can write whatever you like. Um, and it can be a mix of goals, things you want to achieve. It could be values, ways that you want to be in the, in the situation. Or it could be needs. What matters, what needs am I trying to meet in this context? Remembering that the definition of a need is something that helps you to thrive. So in the case that I'm working with, some of the examples I came up with, um, what matters most to me in talking to a parent at school, um, or for the teachers mostly, it was things like listening carefully, upholding school values and policies, respecting the child's confidentiality. Those were all things that mattered. But then when you go down to those other levels of what qualities I'd like to bring curiosity, diligence, enthusiasm, openness, connection, and then needs might be things like connection, awareness, growth, mutuality, trust. Thank you, Laura. I see your comment and farewell. Bye bye. I appreciate the need for sleep. <laughs> thank you so much. I've just and I really appreciate your note. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Sleep bye. well. I will connect. Thank you. Okay. So I guess we'll be moving through this somewhat quickly, but um, I, it, it should be enough to give you a sense of the tool. Um, so I'm going to invite you now to go back to your Mentimeter screen and if you could share just a word or two, short phrase, maybe looking down your list and just circle the top two or three that really matter to you. And you might think of others. Um, if you'd be willing to share desire for resolution, yeah, absolutely. Connection, a couple of people saying that. Truth, safety, growth. Trust, honesty, financial justice, yeah, food security. Most of these are deeply interpersonal, as you might expect, given the way I asked the question, but some of them give a little hint of survival, wow. Lovely. 
okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm guessing maybe that's, okay, that's 13. We've had 13 people, so we could move on there. Um, honesty, connection, respect seems to be what's most up. Authenticity, different versions of those, growth, acceptance, lovely. Just feeling into what that feels like, the, to notice this shared context of what we're wanting in our conflict situations. So I'm going to move on, but um, of course we're holding those things deeply as we move forward. And then after this quadrant, we might just take a break, just to stretch and get out of our chairs, I think. If, but before we do, um, if you are really living in line with what matters to you in that first quadrant, what would you be doing in this situation? And so here I'm really reaching for actual behaviors. Please be careful of things like, um, I wouldn't be judging people or something like that. Um, you know, you can you can put that sort of thing down, but it's shady territory. I think basically try to pick things that a video camera could see. If that that sort of forces a discipline. Um, that uh, what would I be actually doing? Would I be keeping eye contact? I'd be reflecting what I've heard. I'd be um, reviewing policies in advance so that I'm prepared. I'd make it clear to the parent what needs to be kept confidential and so on. These were things that um, uh, teachers would actually need to do by way of preparation to to manifest those qualities up in the top right. This is not just what do I need to do. It's not just a to-do list. It's um, how can I most express those values and needs and and aims that I've, overarching aims that I've expressed up in the top right. We're moving into the world of behavior, what people could actually see, okay? Just putting up my my standing desk. And when you're willing and ready, feel free to share one or two things in whatever form you're willing. These will show up anonymously. Having an open posture. Thank you. Eye contact. Deep listening. Patient tolerance for diverse views. So, um, sharing fully from my heart, yeah. Minimal physical reactivity, okay. And you can see how it's it a lot of these 
uh, communicating mindfully. So let's take that one for a moment. Um, what would mindful communication actually look like? Um, and I acknowledge that not every behaviour can be seen, right? Some behaviour is internal. But uh, if you can kind of zero in a little bit, okay, what would that be? It might be connecting with my body. Um, it might be pausing um, in between sentences. It might be a host of things. Um, so as best you can, just try to come out of our heads a little bit into the world of behaviour because in a sense that's what that's all the other person has is your behaviour. You might have the intention to communicate mindfully or what are some of the others, uh, be tolerant for diverse views, um, uh, bringing into my world uh, experience that a new world is possible. These are all admirable intentions and also they're not things that a person could see in relation to you. Uh, so, just from the point of view of kind of discipline, because we're so used to shorthanding and going up to, well, I'm being tolerant, right? That's what I'm doing. <clears throat> See if you can draw out, what is that behaviourally? They might be able to feel them. Yeah, Shay, that's a fair point. I agree, but, oh, and I, I totally agree, actually. I, I don't wish to minimise um, non-verbal signals and the importance of inner integrity. Um, absolutely, people can feel the space that you're in. <clears throat> and also, I think that we often move to this sort of shorthand for behavioural intentions that I think it's helpful sometimes to think, okay, what, they, what would that actually look like in my behaviour? Ask questions, track the answers, discuss and dialogue, find common language, do self-care beforehand to prepare. Yeah, nice. These are all really clear. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. Would you like to um, just take a break for... Uh, if we can keep this really short, we do have quite a lot um, to cover, um, but I would invite you just to take uh, a few minutes. So let's say um, five minutes. That's for, enough for a cup of tea and, uh, and a stretch. Uh, so five minutes and come back, which would be uh, 14 past the hour on by my clock. Um, okay, that all right with everyone? Great. I can't actually see some of you, but I'm getting nods from all those that I can see. So I'll see you in five minutes' time. And make sure you have a bit of a stretch and connect. All right, see ya.
isn't it mind-blowing finally having a, 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 something that kind of connects the different parts of this puzzle don't you think or am i being too mental no the pieces are starting to puzzle pieces are starting to come together a bit hi everyone hello how are you doing Sakha? hi shanti hi Sakha. <laughs> I was I was turning on my microphone here and thinking, am I being too mental? And then you just said, am I being too mental? <laughs> I don't actually know what you're talking about, actually, because I wasn't part of the conversation. I just came on late, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Alan. How's it going for you? You look very reflective. I am because we're saying hi to the whole internet now because it's still being recorded. Oh, really? Oh, hello. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, hello. So, hello. Hi, 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 internet. Hello, internet. How are you? Hello, uh, people of the World Wide Web. <laughs> and those, those who we know and those we don't know. <laughs> um, but hey. I, I responded to Tanya as I did because I have a feeling that what's going on inside her is the same thing going on inside me. And talk talk about neuroplasticity, Paul. Yeah. Ah, lovely. Yes, there's been a lot of neuroplasticity happening this these last few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Wonderful. Paul, um, you, sorry. Yep. Go ahead. You, you said something that was pristine. You said in darkness, ta da da, grows but I missed that word, that particular, particular word. Intentions, you were talking about the uh, inner thoughts and feelings and transparency. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, oh gosh, I don't know. Um, was it in relation to um, needs? Uh, uh, something that is not verbalized, something that is not put out and then it stays in the dark, and then when it stays in the dark, uh, grows. Oh, yeah, I was talking about um, transparency, I think. I was just saying that selfishness grows, or um, self-interest grows in that situation. Yeah, I mean, it's just the old, I don't know if you have this saying, Everyone has this saying, but basically, uh, actually, I can't even remember the saying now. But there's <laughs> a saying about how corruption grows in 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 darkness. Like, uh, does anyone know that saying? There's something, but basically, you know, when there's a, re a lot of evidence. Actually, it's really interesting. Um, one study that I found fascinating was um, where. Uh, in a tea room, you know, where people are supposed to volunteer money um, for, to pay for their tea and so forth. If 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 you put up a picture of a, of a pair of eyes on the wall, <laughs> people will be more likely to put money in the tea jar just with a picture of a pair of eyes, you know, when you're being seen, you do behave better. It's just the way that things work. Um, so it's quite fascinating how how deeply that runs within us um, as a as an animal. We, um, we anyway. That's another whole conversation. All right, let's move on. Um, okay, I'm feeling refreshed. I've got a cup of coffee. I'm good to go. Hopefully you are too, and had a little stretch. All right, um, let's move on to our next question, and I'll just share the screen with you again. So now from here, um, we can move over into this away side of the matrix. And, um, and here I'm going to invite you to reflect upon what thoughts, feelings, maybe imagery, um, sensations, internal experience, remember, might show up and get in the way of me moving toward one and two. And so this is kind of the stuff that really hooks you and grab you. It, in, in human beings, it's often um, 
sentences. You know, I'm not good enough or, um, or she's out to get me or, or whatever it is. Um, in the case of the teachers, it was things like, if I listen too much, it'll get out of control. She'll get angry. Um, someone else could handle this better than me. You know, some of the stuff that we said earlier, like remember earlier in our conversation, we were looking at the fear we bring into um, conflicts. Some of that stuff, what if the newspaper gets a hold of this? Um, anxiety. One convention that I quite like, and you can't do it in Mentimeter, so you won't be able to share it with the group, but on your piece of paper, if you've got a, if you notice an internal voice that shows up, seeing if you can just capture that with quotes, kind of like an internal statement that you might say to yourself that might show up and get in the way of you really being the person you want to be or meeting your needs in this context. Another sort of natural language way into this is what are your biggest fears? What are your biggest concerns about this situation? What could go wrong? Just making some space for that to be approached rather than avoided. Does everyone understand what, anyone got any questions about this? I'm going to hurt someone. I'm going to be left alone. St stubborn. Just be as best you can, um, you can enter more, by the way, once you've already entered some. If you're thinking something like stubborn, um, it's it's a bit hard to tell with this tool what that means. Um, whether you're meaning I'm going to be stubborn. Just be aware that that's kind of a judgment of you. That's you having processed. Um, seeing if you can contact the thought or the feeling that might drive stubbornness. It might be, I need to be right. Or um, if I let down my guard, she'll take advantage of me. Or, you know, see if you can, what we're trying to do here is kind of step back a little. And, and usually I would probably do this as a bit more of an experiential exercise to just, Maybe we should do that actually. Feel into, if you're just pausing and waiting for a moment, just let your eyes close and feel into the situation, noticing what'll be, who's present, what they're doing.
and then letting yourself become aware of what might show up and get in the way. And as best you can, just trying to track your experience without putting too much judgment or labeling on it. Um, you know, what are you saying to yourself? What's showing up in your body? Yeah, thoughts like they have gender bias, you know, great, perfect. This stuff is really going to get in the way of connection. Um, I need to be protected. Yeah. A lot of this stuff is self-protective. Um, seeing if you can just hold it in that sense of, I'll be misunderstood. Yeah. Misunderstood. They won't understand. I'm dumb if you disagree. I'm going to be left alone. Nothing will change. Gosh, that's a big one. So gaslighting, for instance, let's, I mean, that's a great word and it captures a lot of meaning, but yeah, I guess that they'll undermine me. Hmm. What we're trying to do here is make a little bit of space for there's always in every interaction and every moment, there's multiple levels. There's for, for all of us in particular, we're, we're reaching out to try to connect and engage and love and be with. But as human animals, as organisms, we also are self-protective and the intent here is to connect with some of that capacity to diffuse. I used the word diffusion earlier. Um, the capacity to notice I'm not these thoughts. These thoughts are present within me. They're occurring, but they're not me. I am having them. I am. Ha Another way into this is noticing I am, the distinction between I am being gaslighted and I am having the thought that I'm being gaslighted or, you know, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to sort of hold these things out, not to deny them, not to avoid them, but to put them in a place where we could possibly work with them, where we could come to a different relationship to them. I can't trust them. Beautiful. Perfectly natural, perfectly valid. Fear, I'll be misunderstood. I'm angry. Lovely. So you can see all of this is present and sometimes maybe not you, maybe you're sort of more enlightened than this, but definitely some of your clients when you're working with them, will this will be real, this will be um, difficult for them to contact and quite a revelation to start to explore the possibility of being able to hold some of this material without necessarily acting upon it. So I'm going to move on to the next quadrant, which is basically what do you do when you're really gripped by those thoughts and feelings in three, when they're really, I use this metaphor of a hook, it's like a fishing hook, you know, you're on the end of a line and they've got hold of you and they're taking you in a direction that's away from values, uh, but it's also um, the, the, what you're trying to do is essentially control or get rid of those difficult emotions, those difficult thoughts. So I'm really gripped by them and all I can see is I need to feel better and you kind of lose sight of all of that stuff over on the right hand side. So what might you do if you're really in the grip of those thoughts and feelings 
And the teachers did things like telling rather than listening, apologising too much, speaking indirectly rather than tackling the hard issues, those kinds of things. I tend to just avoid the whole situation sometimes if I'm really gripped by it or um, come out much stronger than I intend to speak more assertively or aggressively. And you don't need a lot on these. Yeah, I found in particular in this quadrant, you really don't need a lot. You just need some of the big things that you do when you're really gripped by those kinds of thoughts. Going into gender roles, avoiding the conflict, losing connection to my heart, you're acting from mine, not from heart. I use my voice. Apologies for my dog. <laughs> Collapsing, avoiding. Being silent. Not paying attention. Meditation, yeah, interesting. So there are things that are, could be quite healthy. Cuddling pets, you know. What do I do? <clears throat> so these things aren't, I want to make it really clear that over on this left hand side, these are not um, bad things, they're not, these are in inevitable aspects of being human and also they're sometimes less effective, sometimes they're fine, but the intention of all these behaviours uh, is basically to try to get rid of the difficult stuff to try to get rid of the pain that's internal to, that we've listed up in that top left-hand side. And we develop all sorts of strategies. We're taught social strategies through our lives to, you know, this is unacceptable. We need to get rid of it. Uh, it's deeply countercultural to us to be able, for most of us anyway, to be able to contact difficult experience and simply have it be there as part of the experience of being an organism, um, part of the experience of being a body that needs to protect itself or a social being that needs to belong. The, again, the intention here is sometimes I use this metaphor with people. Of we have these thoughts and they're right up close to us. And what we're trying to do is sort of 
have them here and notice what these thoughts, when, we're, when they're like this, all we can do is avoid the situation or fight back. But when they're like this, we could perhaps have some choice. They're still with us. We can't do anything about them. Our society tells us, don't worry, be happy, get rid of the difficulties. The acceptance in acceptance and commitment therapy is about connecting with what is. It's already here. Okay. Um, so sometimes what I might do with someone in this situation is invite them to explore how helpful these strategies are in the short term and the long term. And just in, um, if you're looking at your own situation, you might see if there's some of these strategies might be helpful in the long run, some might not. Most times what I find with people is they, they find that these strategies give them short-term relief, but long-term they're not helping them live fully, live fully into that material on the right-hand side. Um, so sometimes that can be a helpful exploration. <clears throat> This, um, having done this exercise with these four quadrants and sort of mapped out our inner experience is part of this is really for our own benefit to prepare. But there's a really key part, if we come back to that psychological flexibility concept that I introduced earlier, if you think of psychological flexibility is Moving in the, it's basically this diagonal here. I don't know if you can see my cursor from the top left to the bottom right. It's moving from, even in the presence of these difficult experiences, moving and doing what really matters, moving towards the bottom right there, or at least moving over to this right hand side. So there's a, a piece of work that needs to be done now that goes beyond just sort of setting goals and intending to be more connected or whatever. And it's this reflection on what do I do with the whole of this matrix? How could I, and really I think I actually wanted to change this question. I was looking at it just before I gave this presentation. It's really the question I really want to ask is how do I hold this matrix? Um, what practices and processes, um, I've, I've framed it up here, what practices best support me in holding the whole of this experience. And, you know, it might be um, awareness of this matrix. It might be putting up, you know, a list of values in context that are really important to me. It might be mindfulness. It might be practicing, I'm noticing that I'm having the experience, this, you know, I'm noticing that I'm angry as opposed to I am angry. It might be, um, Practicing NBC with yourself, connecting with your own needs, um, listening to yourself with self-compassion. What sorts of practices best support you in holding the whole of this experience? And so it's really another way to say this is it's like coming to the center of the matrix where you're just noticing, huh, this is the whole of my experience. There's both sides here. I mean, just doing the matrix is a practice um, in itself, grounding tools, you know, getting grounded in body, present moment. This doesn't have to be particularly, when I say practices, maybe it's sort of reaching for something special and exotic, but I just mean, what do you do? What works for you? What, what helps you get out of your fusion with difficult thoughts and feelings and allow you to get into a space of more openness, 
calling a friend beautiful, singing, communicating my unmet needs gently and with kindness, journaling, beautiful. Beautiful. Requesting, oh, if you're having, if you've just joined and you're putting things in the chat line, this Menti thing is that, that address, if you want to find it, uh, you can enter things in. Communing with nature, grounding, journaling, beautiful. Walking barefoot on soil, leaning on a tree, wonderful. Breath, tapping, shaking, yoga, burning some incense. Accepting and embodying your body. Beautiful. Okay, so we're, we're familiar with some of the practices that might help us. I'm gonna move on because I want to just make a bit of space for where this can really come into its own. Um, so, so what we've done so far is we've created a bit of a map of our internal experience in preparation for moving into this conflict situation. And the intention here, of course, is to get ourselves centered and grounded in our intentions and our best practices, our best self, if you like. But there's more that you can do with this tool, and that's why I think it's so generally useful. Um, one way that you can go is to try mapping the other person's experience. And I want to just share that with you quickly. I'm, I'm, we may not do this as an exercise because I, I really want to leave some time for conversation and see where that goes. But the teachers found this enormously helpful, and also uh, medics, when I've done it with them in the context of a conflict in a medical situation, surgeons fighting with one another. Um, to actually ask, to, 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 to try and create a matrix of the other person, what might they be experiencing? And here is a way that you could do that. I mean, I just made this up on, on the spur of it with the teachers reflecting on what their parents might be experiencing. Um, Obviously, you can ask what might matter most to them in this situation, caring for their child, getting a fair outcome, maintaining a positive relationship with the school, harmony, you know, what might be their needs, safety, understanding, connection, trust. From here, I find it helpful to move to, and what might be showing up internally for them and getting in the way of them actually expressing those things you know, with clarity and um, uh, might get in the way of them expressing those things skillfully. Uh, might be just anger. Uh, they might be thinking, I they won't really listen to me. They'll only be interested in protecting the school, not my child. Whatever it is that might show up in the person that you're engaging with internally? What might be the, first of all, the needs, but then the, the voices that express frustration of those needs? And bear in mind that all of this stuff here on this left-hand side from an NPC point of view um, is also useful for identifying needs. There are needs in these statements, just as there were on your matrix that you have on your page for yourself. If you look over in this top left, that's a beautiful source of identifying underlying needs that you can then put over on this top right hand side. And so if I'm engaging with this other person, what might they do if they get really gripped? How can I prepare for what's likely to show up for them? Um, they might well lash out with accusations. They might blame me for aspects of their child's behavior. That's their responsibility. What else might they do when they're really in the grip of those thoughts and feelings? And then I actually, when I was designing this, I thought this is where I don't, 
I don't really want to say what would they be doing if they were behaving better because that wasn't very useful for me. But what I thought might be useful to plot here, I actually moved back. I hope this isn't too confusing, but in this last quadrant, I'm moving back to you. Um, what can you do to respond most effectively and compassionately to that, those other three quadrants of their matrix? You know, what matters to them, what's showing up for them internally, and what they might be doing that's unskillful. What could you then do? Um, and I felt in the context of the teachers, what they were saying to me was, you know, they could stay with doing the things that they explored in the previous matrix, particularly reflective listening and keeping good notes on the interaction, consulting with the teacher to get my facts clearer before the meeting. So this process, what it enabled the teachers to do was go a bit deeper on preparing for the interaction. Sometimes people prepare the first thing they want to say and all that kind of thing. I find those things a bit rigid, but I do find this process of getting grounded and getting present to what's likely to show up in the other is extraordinarily helpful. So this is just one way you can use the matrix to, to kind of begin to map the other's experience and um, obviously take a screenshot, share with, um, uh, you can email me for all the slides and be happy to share you, with you the whole presentation and, and the results too, the things that we came up with together. Um, the other way that you can use the matrix is, and this I mentioned earlier that um, it's a multi-level tool and the other way that we often use it in in the group context is instead of working personally, we work at the level of the group. So what matters most to us in this situation? What's our shared purpose? If we were really living in line with what matters, what would we be doing collectively? What would be our shared goals and intentions? What might show up for us amongst us, you know, it's inequitable here. Maybe it'll show up for other people, not just me, but what sorts of things are likely to get in our way and what might we do as a group that would uh, that would take us away from what really matters to us and, 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 and away from uh, trying to get away from pain. So you can move to multiple levels and, and sort of reuse this tool to help identify shared identity and purpose in a group. And it's, it's a very easy tool. I mean, it's not, not rocket science, but from my point of view, it identifies these absolutely fundamental dimensions of human experience, approach and avoid toward and away and inside and outside that are just really, really helpful for clarifying needs and finding shared connection that you can bring to um, to conflict. So we have a book. If you want to learn more, you can email me. Um, website, if you want to sign up, join our monthly newsletter. There's a facilitator training course that we offer over 10 weeks. Um, it's online, but it is highly interactive. You have a personal coach that works with your team um, and uh, lots of opportunities to learn this stuff experientially. And so that's it, really. And what I wanted to do with the remainder of the time was kind of open out for conversation. Um, I guess I'd really, if I could just kind of seed the conversation space a little bit, um, the thing that's really interesting to me right now is thinking about um, how this all maps onto nonviolent communication. Nonviolent communication being about, for those of you that don't know, has at its heart this sort of notion of separating out observation, what we can actually see. Um, and requests, which are in, usually in the behavioural realm, from our feelings and needs, which is all this stuff that's up the top. So very analogous, I think. But another thing that um, feels important to me is that if you look at a lot of this stuff over here, this is usually socially acquired. I mean, all of everything obviously is socially acquired in the world of the mind, language, 
or everything we think and feel is is culturally developed. Um, but oftentimes this is about what should be happening and expectations that are arisen from our culture and our society. Um, or maybe it's about um, socially acquired fears and doubts and um, patterns of avoidance that we've acquired from our parents. And we can get into loops here as a society between avoidant behaviour and uh, and further validation that this is the way I have to be. So if we go into a conflict situation not trusting the other, then we're on the lookout, we're sensitised to find evidence of why that mistrust is justified. And we're, we're, we're finding it even where it isn't there. You know, look, he, she was just trying to manipulate me. He was just trying to manipulate me. Um, so there's a way in which, as a society, individually, we can get stuck in a loop over on this side where we're sort of basically getting into a smaller and smaller world because we don't have the skills to be able to step out and connect with what really matters. But we can also do it at a societal level. You know, we erect the walls and we erect the walls and it fuels our fear and we erect more walls and so forth. So I see a lot of overlap. Okay, I'm going to stop talking at this point. I hope that's been useful for people and I'd really invite you to unmute and just share if you have any questions or um, any comments, reflections maybe points where you might find this useful if you've got a context that might be useful. I have a question. Diana, hi. hi. Um, I'm curious what you would say, just this is something that has come up for me and also um, in my experience of attempting to facilitate conflict resolution, um, which is that uh, I've heard from people that it can become too cerebral or like that they feel they express that like their, their intelligence is somehow being questioned by not being able to participate or like they feel blocked by not being able to fully comprehend the process. And I'm just curious if you have any experience with that, and what you would recommend. Thank you, Diana. I'm not sure I fully understand the question yet, so I'm just going to reflect back what I think I heard and, and maybe you can clarify for me. Are you saying that sometimes the processes that you've used or seen used are too much up in the head and that, and that the people are saying, I just don't understand what we're doing? Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, like like to i mean sometimes i think to to trust the process people want to understand it or like what mm -hmm. what is um <clears throat> unfolding um because i've it's been reflected to me that um uh people have f felt um that maybe becoming uh using observation and what you're calling diffusion, I think that was the word, um, mm -hmm. they might feel manipulated, manipulated or that like they're, they're not understanding the framework or they're not understanding, like they feel somehow threatened um, or triggered just, mm -hmm. by, just by the process itself mm -hmm. and therefore mistrusting mm -hmm. and that that seems to somehow obstruct going forward at all. And like how to accommodate yeah. those different, those needs of like, some people are not as like academically able to understand mm. the subtleties of this. Yeah, I think, I've, I think I've got a feel for it. Thank you very much for the question. I'm so pleased you didn't leave with that unasked. Um, 
I've presented this in a way that's uh, where I've been simultaneously leading you through the process but also trying to explain it to you. I would never do anywhere near that amount of explanation of all of these elements with a person I'm working with. In fact, I may not even mention toward, away or inside or an outside. I might just put a cross on a page and, and then as, as I'm talking to them, I'll just be grouping things. Um, so it, for, a, for a time I was a clinical psychologist and I would um, work in the clinical space and a client would come in and just as a kind of case analysis, if you like, of what was going on, I'd just have a piece of paper in front of me and when they started talking, I'd be putting usually top left stuff, this is what's showing up for me, really difficult material that's showing up for me. And then I'd be saying, okay, what really matters to you in this situation? And I'd start populating that quadrant. And so it's just, it becomes very, very natural. And if you're worried that it's too cerebral, which I think was part of your question, there is a way in which I am emphasizing the thoughts that show up. Um, and I'm conscious that many people work, do body work and do work that's much more situated and I would encourage that and say that it absolutely needs to be there as well. It's not all just, you know, the head guiding things, but, but our appraisals, our judgments of the situation are also important. We construct our world and we construct stories about our world. And so I want people to be able to map those stories, you know, what's, what is shaping my behaviour. So hopefully that helps a little, does that? Yeah, cool. yeah. And I think it's, maybe it's true that part of it is, making it an invitation to become better acquainted and curious about their experience so that it's not like yeah. we're, we're sort of, I don't know, there's a different like way in which we can approach it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah so pleased you mentioned that. And I apologize if I've given the wrong impression that we're sort of forcing this model. I actually really take time and say, look, I just want to, um, if I'm going to introduce the model at all, I do it in the context of here's a lens where you could sort of sort through some of your experiences because I know there's a lot going on at the moment and it's kind of all a jumble. So let's see if we can sort some of that out. Here's one way of doing that sorting. And really all you're trying to do is invite them to discriminate. What are the toward elements? What are the away elements? What are the, what's going on internally and what am I actually doing about it? Um, so you're just teaching them those sorting skills, if you like, in this space. Um, but, you know, take a huge dose of humility with it all. It's just one tool. If it's not helpful, do something else. And, and please, don't feel that this has to be an intellectual tool. I, I don't experience it that way. I think that it's, it's just as possible that these hooks are, are half-formed fragments of an image or a, a bodily sensation that drives us away, you know, and we want to map that as well. Thank you. Any other questions or... Reflections and can, yeah, Deborah. I do have a question, Paul, and it came up for me when we were working in the third quadrant. Um, mm -hmm. And it, the question of, for lack of a better word, gaslighting. Um, just that question in my direct experience of mm. just a denial that what has been said or or done um or i just i guess i'm perplexed and maybe i don't understand gaslighting um <laughs> i'm sure you do um you. It's, yeah uh, uh so again i'm going to reflect is the question um What we're interested in, in in the matrix is one's personal experience. And one of the personal experiences might be, I'm being gaslighted here. Or, 
uh, or it might be um, that per uh, well no it's the same thing that person's gaslighting me so but but you see that we're not proclaiming truth here this is not this is not about that this tool is about what's showing up for me and so as to whether it's true or not I think that's is that is that your question that's got, I'm, I'm I'm still trying to clarify a little as to what what is the question as to whether or not gaslighting can be part of my experience I would say it certainly can be so if I'm trying to connect and I'm scared, so, mm. and I am being gaslighted, it's real, right? So, yeah, I guess from an NVC point of view, you'd, you'd want to explore um, to what extent do people have power to undermine me, to force me to question my own reality? You know, I you want to be asking yeah. that question. But I think you could say, in this moment, I have the experience of feeling gaslighted and that is causing me to shut down. You know, and so if you look at that left hand side, you could map that experience as your own experience and, you know, take responsibility for that, you know. Um, hmm. So, um, I'm not in any way saying that the experience of gaslighting doesn't happen, by the way, in case anyone's hearing that in my voice. I'm just saying that the only place of power from which we can do something is from our position of being able to acknowledge both what's happening in the world and also how we're responding to it the sense we're making of it mm. thank you is that adequate deborah yes thank you tanya you might have the last word i think um we're just coming up to the time yeah i noticed you unmuting what Oh, I'm sorry. You, oh, sorry. I just noticed. I'm, st I'm still in the gaslighting and the stonewalling. First, I had a language gap, and now, is the purpose of acceptance as a principle uh, like a, um, I don't want to say a barrier, but um, if we are here, if we are now, and if I am present in this situation, trying to understand what my position in it is. Uh, how does gaslighting come to play out? Uh, I don't know if that made sense at all. Yeah, no, no, I think, well, if I can come back to the model, how it plays out in terms of the matrix model yes. is, I am being undermined. I am, um, oh, okay. I am questioning my own reality. Mm -hmm. I am, you know, it's, it's a series of experiences that one, has to make sense of this experience and and that might include he's doing this to me he is undermining me and and there's a sense in which that can be true and intentional and part of the situation and there's also a sense in which there's a choice that one's giving that power to the person so there's a sense in which both of those things can be true and as a question of mapping what's most helpful for me. In the end, this model is comes out of deeply pragmatic perspective. I mean pragmatic in the sense of American pragmatism, you know, what works. There is ultimately no truth in this socially constructed world. All there is is what works to enable me to meet my needs and the needs of others and, and move towards what really matters. Um, so what works in this context? And if, you know, blaming and using the language of gaslighting and so on is working, great. If it's not working so well, then try something else. Um, so I think that's where I'm 
landing with that one, wanting to be very sensitive to the experience of being systematically undermined, though, as as you know, and all the relational issues that come up with that in in committed relationships and so forth. Well, we're at the hour, and people are going to need to drop off and take breaks and things like that. But um, uh, could I just say thank you very much for taking part, and um, please drop me a line if you'd like to learn more or just connect. I'd love to hear from you. It hasn't. We've had a lot of interaction in some ways, but uh, I, I haven't had so much an opportunity to hear your voices, and so uh, maybe you could all unmute and. Just say farewell in whatever way you'd like to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Farewell. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Carly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alan.